Hello, my name is Matthew Baird, and this is my graduate lecture topic, which will be the five whys. To go along with this reading, uh, the five whys, I got a reading by David Grubb. Uh, this reading came out of Wood Digest magazine in May 2008. Uh, when assigning these students, I would have them uh, have this reading available by a PDF, as I have designated out here. Uh, what's important about this guy, uh, he's a manufacturing consultant. Uh, basically, he works in specializing cabinet, flat panel, uh, pretty much any kind of uh, wood product manufacturing, so TV cabinets. Um, the cabinet right up here would be a good example of that as well. And we're going to go into his use of the five whys and why it helped them uh, moving forward. Next slide. So first off, what are the five whys? Um, it's not yes, Yankee, or anything that starts with why. It's a tool that you can use to help work through problems. A uh, technique, uh, for lack of a better term. When could you use them? Uh, typically, the best way or application to use the five whys are if you have a problem, um, something that you need to uh, logically work your way through a process to get through a problem. Typically, something that's a little more complicated, uh, multifaceted, um, something more... Uh, more complex. Where should or where could you use them? Um, you can typically use these anywhere. Uh, they apply to both the workplace, uh, school, at home, if you have personal problems, anything like that. This is a very effective tool you can use to work through your problems and find the root cause of what is giving you your issues. Why should you use them? Um, like I stated before, many problems are very complex in nature. Um, if you just try to look at the problem in one big chunk, say, yep, that's the answer right there, and call it done, uh, there's a very good chance you're going to overlook a lot of issues that embed are embedded within the problem. Uh, most problems are not straightforward. They need to take a lot of iterations through a problem-solving process to get to the answer that you are really looking for versus one that just seems to be apparent and easy to get to. And then how should you use them? Um, the five whys, like I said, they're a tool, but just like any other tool, if you don't know how to use it, or if you use it in the wrong application, it's not gonna do you any good. Uh, using the five whys will not help you solve the theory of relativity, but it will help you solve uh, issues with maybe a relationship, uh, manufacturing issues, uh, design problems, things of that nature. All right, now going into reading review, we're going to discuss uh, what the issue that the author had in his uh, situation. So basically, like I said, he was manufacturing cabinets and they were not square. So I'm going to draw an example of the board what he was talking about. It's going to be a little blown up and out of proportion, but I'm doing this just to kind of give you a clear picture of what's really going on. Let's say I'm just building a simple square cabinet. And obviously when you do this, you want it to be square. So you'd have you know, 90 degree angles there, 90 degree angles here. But his issue was one side was too small. So let's say this corner right here is not 90 degrees. So here, I got them overblown a little bit, like I said, just to kind of exaggerate what's going on. But let's say that that leg here, this corner, is not 90 degrees. And that's the issue that he was having and that he was brought into uh, with a manufacturing company to consult and hopefully get to the bottom of their problem. So, going through the whys the iteration. First one, why is the cabinet square? He said, one end panel is not the correct size. Makes sense. So it would be possible solutions for this. Well, if one panel is not the correct size, let's just cut it again. So over here, I'm going to put some answers for some possible solutions. So solution one, cut it twice. All right, well, if we did, if we kept on going along, the next question would be, well, why isn't the end panel the correct size? And if you go back to there, to the first thing, that was our answer to question one, the first one. So the second why, why isn't the end panel the correct size? His answer, it was not cut to the proper size of the panel saw. Okay, makes sense. So it would be possible solutions for this. Well, if it's not cut to the proper size, with one possible solution that is, well, maybe we just need to measure it more. So, our second solution, first we cut twice, now we're going to measure twice. Just 
person. Going on. Well, going on from the second one, if you go back, and the answer was it was not cut to the proper size of the panel saw. Well, the next one would be, well, why wasn't it cut to the proper size on the panel saw? Answer, the saw does not cut all parts to the same size. So what are possible solutions? Well, if the saw doesn't cut all parts to the same size, maybe your saw is malfunctioning or it's faulty. So one possible solution is just buy a new saw. So we're get, making progress, supposedly. So now, OK, buy a new saw, good to go, right? Well, let's just keep digging and see what we find. So question number four, why does the saw vary when cutting? Well, uh, here we go, the blade defects. So what are solutions? And if you have a wondering what this means, so when your blade deflects, typically you would cut some chalk. Your saw blade would make a nice, even saw cut or kerf is the technical term. When your blade deflects, kind of wobbles like this, so you actually get a wider kerf when your blade starts flexing when you're sawing. So basically, you can get a saw cut kerf two or three times larger than what you want. So this one is the blade deflex. So what do we need to do? Well, maybe we need to get a more expensive soft blade that doesn't deflex so much. So number four is better saw blade. So question number five, we kept on going, well, why does the blade deflect? Answer, the blade is defective, so possible solutions. Well, now we place, got a better saw blade, maybe we're not using the right type of saw blade. Um, as you know, saw blades come in all different sizes, different teeth grooves, something like anything of that nature. There's a myriad of different saw blades you can use for the right application. So it's potential, this solution, and since our original saw blades are working, maybe we need a different type of saw blade. solutions that we came up with and see what happens if we stop at each one. So the first one is we're going to cut each board twice to get to the right length just to make sure. Um, possible issues with that, um, if you cut everything twice that takes more time, that takes more money, you're not being as efficient as you could possibly. Uh, so let's move on to the second one. Measure each one twice to make sure you get it cut right. Obviously this would you know, make good practice if you're working at your home or whatever, you know, cutting your own wood. In this case, if you measure reduce anything twice, you're killing your efficiency, time costs money. So that's not the really the best answer either. It solves your problem, but you're paying for it. Number three, buy a new saw. Well, that shouldn't make sense in itself. Are you for sure your saw is broken? Well, let's just replace it anyways. Well, that costs money, and you may be replacing a piece of equipment that does not necessarily need to be done. Number four, well, let's just buy a more expensive saw blade. Okay, but you get a little bit less cost, getting a little bit closer to the problem, but maybe your type of saw blade was wrong in the first place, which leads us to number five. Maybe we need to investigate different types of saw blades, maybe one that fits the application better than one we are already using. So if you look at this, every time you stop an early step, you could potentially solve your problem. By cutting twice, you will get yourself square cabinets, but at what price? And on and so on with each of the steps. So we got to the last answer we need to get a different type of saw blade. Does that mean we're done? Author says, well, maybe not. Uh, the author of the reading goes into something called the, cur the current reality tree. Uh, it's just basically taking the five whys and bringing it up to a 20-step process. Uh, looking over it, it's a pretty robust uh, iteration process. We're not going to cover it here. Um, be a definitely a good thing to research, maybe to look into what you're doing. It's a more formalized process versus just asking why to each problem you've got. Uh, and it is a pretty good problem solving tool, but it is very intensive. Uh, five whys, just something you keep in your back pocket. You can use it whenever you want to. You don't need to really plan ahead. you got a problem, it's like, okay, let's use the five whys, see where it takes us.
So that being said, we used our five wives, didn't necessarily get to the bottom of the problem. So to use this process, you have to be an expert, right? You have to be an expert, use a more intensive process to get anywhere using this type of problem solving tool. Answer, of course, is no. So the next portion is, well, if I don't have to be an expert, or if I, how do you become an expert? Um, I would argue that everyone is an expert at something, even though they may not realize it. Um, also, kind of going into this, you, if you're, say you're working on a job or an internship or co-op, and of course you know a lot less than the people that have been working there 5, 10, 20 years. Those, I would argue, are the people you need to talk to, get their knowledge, pick their brain, and they will help you become an expert. Uh, if you have a problem or a uh, project that you have to work on, if you use this 5Y tool, that will at least show that you have started somewhere, gotten somewhere, put something together, and you can take that information to whoever you are asking and at least show them that you made a good faith effort to try to solve your own problems versus just taking it to them, saying, oh, I'm stuck, I can't get anywhere on this one. So even if you are a novice at whatever you're doing, you could potentially use this and help yourself along. All right, so we got a class example now, and we're going to use a example I actually got from the career fair regarding wind termites. So I'll just kind of read over it now. So this one uh, recruiter that makes turbines for his company, he said the main housing on his turbine kept on cracking. But however, you go through the calculations statically, dynamically, it all work, it all checks out okay. So on paper, all the calculations work out, so it should be strong at the whole, but for some whatever reason, it's still developing cracks. So I'll kind of draw it up here a little bit, just kind of give you a better idea what's going on. So here's your wind turbine right here. So we have pardon my lovely artistic work. Here's your hub. You would have one blade going out here, one blade going out here. I'm not gonna draw the third blade, this is where I want to show the cracks are happening. But right around here where the hub spins, it's getting these little cracks, micro fractures are developing in this housing. You can't figure out why, that's why those are developing. So let's use the five Ys on this application and see where it takes us. So I'll go through my solutions. I kind of have a picture up here. Uh, just kind of give you a little bit of reference. What we're looking at is this junction right here, this connection. So here's your main shaft. Here's your hub. Your blades can be attached. At each circle here, there's three of them. This is an exploded view. The blades are removed. The top of the housing is removed to kind of expose kind of what we're looking at. So my first solution is, well, the first initial question is, well, why does the housing keep, cra keep cracking? Well, the first solution is, well, despite, despite the calculations, it's not strong enough, so we need to build it bigger. Um, so that's our first solution. So if all else fails, just build it bigger, over-engineer it, and eventually it'll get somewhere where it won't fail on you. here and just over engineer it until it holds to what we're using it for. All right, but we're going to keep on going for question number two. So the question number two is, well, why isn't the housing strong enough? Answer uh, that I came up with are the bearings are moving erratically. Improve the bushings to hold the bearings. So if you look right here, it's actually kind of drawing there. There's a main bearing right here that that main shaft spins on. Um, you can improve your performance on there, but if you make those, those bearings inherently have a little bit of space in them because you got you know the ball bearings inside spinning around, they have to have a little bit of clearance to get put in there. Um, the more expensive bearings you buy, the tighter that clearance gets and the tighter your tolerances will get. So as with everything, you spend a little bit more money, get a little bit tighter tolerances, they perform a little bit better for you. So the second question, second solution is use better pushing the bearings. Let's just say that's not enough though, so we're going to move on to the third why. So moving on, why are the bearings moving erratically? Well, we can say, well, the bearings vibrate 
because of the motion, uh, maybe we can buy better barracks. So we've attacked the bushings and bearings. So the third one is buy a better type overall of bearing. Buy something that maybe resists the vibrations, maybe has a little bit more stiffer construction. Uh, there are many different types of bearings out there in the market that you can use that might uh, help you mitigate these problems. But as of course, the nicer piece of equipment you buy, the more money you're going to pay for. All right, so let's keep moving on. So why do the bearings vibrate? Well, as with all things, the turbine blades are out of balance. The things are going to vibrate. So my fourth solution would be: we'll use tighter tolerances while building the blades. All right. Sounds easy enough, right? We are going to take a 100 foot long fan blade and build them all identical so they're all in balance. So, better blades. Hopefully, you guys are picking up on the doors I'm leaving open to why some of these solutions may not be the best idea, but we'll keep doing them. All right, and number five. Why are the turbine blades out of balance? Well, like I said before, they're not identical in size, weight, and geometry. Um, you run into this problem quite a bit into a car tire. A lot of time your single car tire will be out of balance because your rim is not perfect. Uh, your tire tread may wear unevenly. There could be all sorts of things that, that factor into it. And if you ever notice when you're at the shop and they put a new tire on there, they'll put it in a machine, it spins a tire, it spits out a number for the technician working your tire and he takes a lead weight and puts it on your rim. Uh, this is done to balance your tire. So you can you see the same thing in your ceiling fans. If you ever have ever bought a ceiling fan, you'll see that each it comes with them um, with a uh, set of small weights that you can put in your fan to help balance it out. Uh, basically you have the same issue with your or potentially the same issue with your wind turbine. You have a giant fan that is on the order of 200 feet in diameter, and the blades are out of balance. So, how do you solve this problem? Well, as before, you find a way to add or subtract uh, masses within the blades or hum to redist hub, excuse me to redistribute your weight and your, put your center of gravity of your blades back in the center of your main shaft, and then it's nice and balanced for you, ideally. All right, now what did we learn? All right, well, let's go back a little. So with this, let's go back to uh, the original solutions. So solution number one was just to build the main housing bigger. All right, we're gonna add, let's say we're gonna build it twice as big. Well, we don't know for sure, how much bigger we have to build it because like I said before the earlier calculation said hey this thing is statically sound it can handle the loads so you got to pick a number build it bigger and hope you're correct and you know when you're dealing with the giant wind turbine you can see where issues like that could arise. Uh, second one use better bushes, bushings and bearings all right easy enough you could spend a little bit more money to buy the bushings and bearings it might not be overall in the entire price a uh, bad thing but if you're wrong or if it doesn't solve the problem then you have to go up to these things, which are 100 and some feet in the air with the crane, take it apart, fix the bearings, and then put them back together. Uh, same thing for the solution number three, buy a better type of bearing. Um, ideally, it could work, but uh, the first pair, the original bearing you had seemed to work out just fine on paper, so how do you know for sure that the next set of bearings will work out right? So then we got into like, well, maybe it's a balance issue. So it's like, well, let's just build better blades. All right, that makes some easy sense. But then again, you are building something that is on the order of 80 to 100 feet long, and your tolerances for something that long is not going to be plus or minus one inch. It's going to be plus or minus a foot around that type of order. So you need, you're not going to be able to build your, those things exactly the same to get them to balance exactly out. So that gets us to the first, to the last problem. Well, we can't make all the blades identical, maybe we can make a system inside the hub that redistributes a random mass or whatever small enough to balance it out, and then that way the turbine can spin properly. All right, so what did we learn? Uh, we 
worked through a couple problems like this, we found out that yes, it can be an effective tool to get to the root of a problem. Uh, we found out that if we stopped at an earlier solution, yeah, it may solve a, a symptom of the problem, yeah, it may actually solve the problem, but it may not be the most cost effective way to do it. Uh, the next part is, must you use some kind of critical thinking during, the, thinking during this process? If you use this technique on a process that you have, or on an application that you have, zero to no idea is very complicated, uh, this could get, lead you into a false sense of security. Um, we use it on a wind turbine, which by all means is a pretty, pretty complex problem, and we just took a quick stab at it. We, did, we got somewhere, but you know, who knows whether or not that solution is even possible. But at the very least, you have something you can take to a coworker, a supervisor, or anybody else, and you have something to bounce off with them, possibly to come up with a better solution. Now, like I said before, this can be problematic if you're in an unfamiliar scenario. So if you're using this on something brand new, something pretty complex, go ahead, give it a shot, but you know, make sure you use caution while doing it. It's not going to make you an expert. Don't think you're going to take the solution, take it to your boss, and think you just reinvented the world. Chances are, someone else may have already came up with it that worked there for a while, or there may be a few more holes poked into it. So this gives you a starting point to solving your problems. All right, now we're into the questions. No questions, we'll move on to the in-class example. All right, so this class, we're gonna move into the class exercise, and this is gonna be an individual effort class exercise. All right, to start with, I want you to get out a piece of paper and write down a personal problem in your life. Nothing in particular, it can be anything. Some examples I got there, it could be a financial problem. Um, I can't get my bills paid on time, I don't have enough money, I'm using a lot of credit cards. Uh, it could be a relationship, well, my roommate and I are getting along, I'm not getting along with my parents, not getting along with my family, um, boyfriend, girlfriend, any of that kind of issues. Um, another thing, oh, I can't get to class on time, or you know, I'm constantly off schedule, anything of that nature. Go ahead and take a few minutes, write that problem down, and see just to kind of get it start with. So all right, everyone's got a problem. We'll move on to, all right, now this is where you take what you learn, use the five whys on your problem and see where it takes you. Uh, make sure you go through all five steps. Don't just look at the problem and say, oh, okay, well, I have a financial problem and you make more money. Well, that might seem pretty easy. That may solve a symptom. And if you, everyone could make more money, yeah, sure, why not, it could work. But that may not be your real problem. You need to make sure Take your time, use all five whys, use a little bit of discipline, we're all adults here, and make sure you get through this and see where you're in though. So with that, that is the end of my presentation, but I got permission from the professor to give you guys a little bit of an Easter egg here. So we talked about wind turbines, and there's nothing more fun than seeing a wind turbine fall to pieces. For your viewing pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. They should have used better barracks. Yes. Oh, and here it is in slow motion. Yeah, uh, coming to pieces. Oh, and in reverse. Thank you.